Um, good morning. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Robo Global's July 2022 investor call. My name is Jeremy Capron. I'm director of research, and I'm talking to you from New York on a beautiful summer day. Uh, with me on the call today, Nina Decker and Zeno Mercer, my colleagues from the research team. And uh, let's take a look at the agenda for today's call, which is broadcast live and will be available as a replay on our website. So I will start with a brief reminder of what we do at Robo Global. Uh, then uh, we'll share some thoughts around the recent um, market developments, and then we'll take a closer look at each of the three index portfolios, Robo, HTEC, and Think. And of course, we'll be taking your questions. So please feel free to type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So let me kick off here with this overview of RoboGlobal. We are a research and investment advisory company. We're focused on robotics, AI, and healthcare technologies. And we manage three primary index portfolios that are tracked by over $3 billion in assets today. They're primarily in ETFs on the New York Stock Exchange, as well as in Europe and in Asia. And the most notable index is Robo, which was the first robotics automation uh, index portfolio that started just about eight years ago in 2013. And we also run Think, or THNQ, that is the Artificial Intelligence Index, and HTEC, HTEC, that is the Healthcare Technology and Innovation Index. And you can see here the annualized returns since the inception of each index as of the end of last quarter, uh, as of the end of, of June 2022. So these index portfolios, they combine research with the benefits of index investing and the ETF wrapper. And they are composed of um, the best in class companies from all around the world, that is small, mid and large caps that we research and we score on various metrics to determine if they're included and at what weighting. And then we rebalance every quarter. So the result is portfolios that have a very low overlap with broad equity indices like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ or global equity indices. Okay, so let's talk about what we're seeing in the markets and I'll just skip to the next slide. Yes, thank you. Um, it was a very challenging quarter to say the least. Global equities were down 16% in the second quarter and the first half was the worst since 1970s in the public equities. And our three index portfolios declined more than 20%. Uh, we had inflation ramping up to the highest levels in 40 years and the print again this morning uh, is showing the highest inflation since, since 1981. Um, we had a considerably more hawkish Fed that's playing catch up. Uh, we had an escalation of the conflict in Ukraine. And in the last 45 days or so, um, the fear of a recession has been driving another big shift in the markets. Now, this is probably quite depressing for a lot of investors and financial advisors. But I think for us, investors in automation technology, there is a silver lining. And I think... Um, an opportunity. This is not a first bear market. And if you look at prior market cycles and recessions, automation companies have come out the other side stronger and consistently returned to new highs. Now, when you think about the problems we're facing today in the global economy, labor shortages, supply chain disruptions, um, the rising costs across the board, the one clear and straightforward response to that is automation. And business leaders and corporations are making it a top priority. And that is showing in the numbers. In fact, and I will come back to that, demand for automation today outpaces supply capacity. There is more demand for robots and automation systems than providers can supply. And at the same time, this down market is giving investors um, an opportunity to invest in these companies at a discount where uh, we're seeing clear value emerging. The three portfolios are now trading significantly below their historical average valuations. And so if we look at the robo index, I'll go to the next slide um, that shows the, the performance uh, over the past five years. 
one must go back to the great financial crisis and the second half of 2008 to observe a drawdown that's comparable to what we saw in the first half of 2022 when the index was down 35, 36%. And historically, um, the drawdowns in that range of 30% have presented very interesting opportunities. Now, what's different from the great financial crisis of 2008 is that the decline this year is almost entirely driven by multiple compression, the, mo the compression in the valuation multiples. Uh, if we look at fundamentals, sales and earnings, uh, the estimates for the current year have remained more or less unchanged over the past three months, and they've actually improved by 4% over the past year. So sales and earnings have been revised up during the past 12 months, while the valuation multiples have collapsed. And I think if fundamentals are trending up and better than expected, that is because demand for automation technology and solutions has remained very strong and actually better than expected even a year ago. And it also shows the ability of companies in the robo index to, um, to deal with those rising costs and the supply chain challenges that they're facing. Um, if we look at the next chart, the valuation chart, this is uh, the next 12 months uh, price to earnings ratio um, in aggregate for, for robo. And the forward PE today is 22 times. And that compares to 32 times at the beginning of the year. And if we look at it in terms of uh, the sales multiple, the EV to sales multiple, we are now just above three times. And that compares to 3.8 times six months ago. So it's a more than one third compression in uh, the valuation multiples, while the fundamentals have continued to improve. Uh, if we look at the earnings trajectory uh, for, for the index, um, we're looking at a 13% sales growth for this year and 9% for next year, which is still significantly above what is expected from uh, uh, broader equity indices like the S&P 500 or, or Acqui. And the other point I want to make on valuations before we move on um, is, is that Robo is not concentrated on high-flying expensive stocks. No, it's quite the opposite. Robo is diversified across uh, fast-growing companies and, and slower-growing lower multiple stocks. You can see here the distribution of uh, valuations for the 80-plus holdings, uh, the 80 plus stocks that are composing this, uh, this robo index. And there really are only, um, uh, only eight out of 81 that I think could be characterized as very high growth and high multiple with a sales multiple about 10 times. And these are companies like NVIDIA or uh, Intuitive Surgical in the surgical robotic space or Manhattan Associates, which has uh, a very strong recurring revenue model uh, in, in the warehouse automation uh, market. And then at the other end of the spectrum on the left side, you can see that there are uh, actually more stocks in Robo with a sales multiple below one, which would characterize as, uh, as cheap stocks. These are typically some of the Japanese and German um, smaller cap companies that are now looking quite cheap. Uh, moving on to the next slide, which shows a breakdown of uh, the robo index by subsector. And you can see the returns for the quarter and for the past 12 months on the right hand side. Um, I like to point out the diversification in the index, remind everybody that this is not just uh, a, a concentrated bet on a handful of technology uh, stocks. You, know, you have broad diversification across the most promising vertical industries where uh, autonomous systems and robotics are being deployed, like manufacturing, um, uh, like the food and uh, agriculture uh, space or uh, uh, healthcare, of course. Um, and uh, I'd like to zoom in on to logistics automation because uh, that sector, which represents about 13% of the portfolio today, is now down 42% over the past 12 months. And so we've seen a third consecutive quarter of lackluster performance from uh, logistics automation. And it's particularly surprising because the sector continues to experience 
historically high demand and very strong orders. Um, we all know about supply chains being under tremendous stress. Um, U.S. consumer demand that remains uh, pretty healthy at this point. And um, I think um, the, uh, the, the shift to e-commerce that remains in, in full swing. So we believe that this sector, and again, it's about 13% of the portfolio, it offers very attractive opportunities in our view. And more generally, um, what we are seeing, what we're hearing from uh, the leaders of uh, uh, the companies in the Robo Index is that robotics demand remains exceptionally strong and the world's top manufacturers of factory robots just can't keep up. Uh, if we look at FANUC, which is uh, the global leader in that market it's based in Japan, uh, FANUC is now sitting on a record high order backlog of um, uh, nearly $3 billion. Uh, that is more than double uh, the level uh, that they had before the, the, the COVID pandemic uh, started. And that is more than one full year worth of, of sales. And uh, the number two player in this market, that's Yaskawa, is another Japanese company. They just reported orders uh, and uh, with their results a few days ago. And, and their orders were 15% above estimates. So that, that, that really reflect that continued trend where uh, demand is consistently above um, uh, production capacity is a very tight market and demand remains very healthy. And as we head into the earnings season, we think that orders that other robo members like, like ABB, like Teradyne, but also Fanuc and Yaskawa will remain near all time highs. Um, and and, and uh, I think, of course, you have to uh, look at the current challenges in the, in the global economy and some of the, the biggest trends out there, like the shift to e-commerce or the shift to electric vehicles that require a much higher level of intensity of use of, uh, of automation. And of course, the labor shortages that are increasingly pressing, and that's putting automation at the top of business leaders' minds. So again, that commentary is really to uh, highlight how there is a disconnect today between the collapse in the valuation multiples that we've seen, and that's been driven by uh, some broader macro shift in the, in, in the equity market, where uh, we've seen a lot of froth around uh, certain areas and some speculative, uh, let's say, uh, activity in certain corners of the market. Well, that um, the, the collapse in those areas has really taken uh, some of the top quality uh, names together with them. Um, so next, I want to touch on some of the big movers. I know a lot of you like to uh, hear about companies in, in the portfolio. Uh, and uh, while you may know about a, a few of the RoboIndex members, some of the headliners like an NVIDIA or a FANUC that are quite well known in large companies, uh, the reality is that the vast majority of the stocks in the RoboIndex, you, you probably don't know very well, if at all, because they tend to be smaller and mid-cap companies that fly under the radar. Uh, they fall in between different gigs uh, sectors um, and, uh, and they're typically not included in the broad equity indices like the S&P 500. Um, so we'll start with the bad news huh? and uh, auto store, uh, which, uh, which was the worst performer in the quarter, the stock was down more than 60% in just three months. And AutoStore is a very interesting company and interesting stock. This is a warehouse robot technology company that invested and continues to lead uh, uh, the market towards cube storage automation, uh, which is a very dense solution for order fulfillment. So e-commerce companies and um, uh, logistics companies are uh, using this cubic system that can fill almost entirely uh, the warehouse. Uh, so it's a three-dimensional cube in which robots are moving around and picking boxes and, 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 and doing the, the storage and, um, and retrieval automatically at very high speed. And AutoStore IPO'd last year after uh, having installed more than 700 of those systems in 40 different countries. Uh, they're serving uh, essentially a who's who of uh, global blue chip companies in a very wide range of industries. Uh, we've been following AutoStore for almost a decade now. They just went public last year. 
uh, after um, really being able to, to scale up and uh, the valuation has been just cut in half in a, a single quarter uh, after the company reported a, 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 a slowdown in orders in the first quarter to 32% growth. I mean, this is still very exciting growth in our view. Uh, and in fact, uh, AutoStore maintained their guidance for the full year, which is to grow sales by uh, somewhere between 70 and 80%. So very fast um, uh, growing business here. Um, that's also supported with more than $500 million in orders at the end of, of uh, the first quarter. So orders are up you know, significantly and auto stores already a highly profitable uh, business with the EBITDA margin of more than 40%, right? So it, ha it has earnings now, you know, every, every quarter and, and, and cash flows as well. And now the stock's trading on just 22 times. So uh, that's, that's uh, uh, an interesting one to highlight. And uh, the other one I wanted to touch on is a Chinese company that was the best performer in the portfolio in, in the second quarter. That's uh, Shenzhen Innovens, uh, which is uh, a provider of uh, certain factory automation components, primarily uh, uh, power inverters and servo motors. Those are critical components that make uh, uh, automation systems possible. And Innovance originated from Huawei's electronic business, and its leaders came from Emerson uh, Electric uh, Network Power Unit. And uh, they, they, the, the business uh, continued to grow a very high clip in the 30 to 35% range. It's gaining share. It's basically displacing some of the Western providers uh, in the Chinese market. And uh, we're, we're seeing their, their market share gains uh, really uh, uh, sustained. Um, so finally, I think um, we're gonna touch on a new addition to the index from last month. And because it's a company that is in both the robotics and automation index and the artificial in intelligence index, uh, I'm gonna pass it on to Zeno, who will take it from here. Go ahead, Zeno. Thanks, Jeremy. Hey, everyone. Zeno here. And uh, today we'll be covering Samsara. As you can see uh, in, the, in the slides presented, um, you know, it's a company that does a lot of real world physical object operations. So we've actually been following Samsara long before they went public uh, this past year, December 2021. Um, it had three years of strong performance, uh, growing from 120 million revenue for fiscal year 2020 growing to 428 um, by 2022. And they recently raised expectations uh, to 600 million for fiscal year 2023. So we've seen really impressive growth in a very challenging macro environment. Um, and I'll get to why they've been so successful in a second. So the company was founded in 2015 by uh, two previous co-founders of a successful uh, Wi-Fi connected technology company that exited to Cisco. Um, so we, decided to include it, uh, Centaura into Robo and Think. Um, so essentially they're a pioneer and technology market leader in connected sensor systems for asset tracking and AI powered video analytics. Um, so right now the company operates over a million IOT devices and collects over 2 trillion data points annually. Um, so they provide best in class solutions in sensing, video, data analytics, providing security and vehicle fleet telematics across multiple industries, such as government utilities, global logistics companies, manufacturing and construction. Um, and this is resulting in major cost reductions, safety, sustainability, and improved operations for um, right now 15,000 plus customers worldwide. Um, majority of those are still in the US. So there's lots of red room, both in the US and globally for growth. Um, and another uh, tailwind for them is, uh, in many cases, you're seeing a mandatory upgrade for compliance and regulatory reasons, whether it's uh, emissions or just safety and just tracking vehicle uh, movements and such. Um, and just for those wondering, there, as we did add this to both Think and Robo, there is a 14% overlap of Robo and the Think Index. Um, and on to the next slide, please. So Think is our AI innovation index. Um, this quarter at, in lockstep with the market, we've seen um, a lot of the gains uh, relative to global indices given up. 
to global equity benchmarks. And we saw a decline of around 28% driven by valuation contraction and macroeconomic fears. Uh, this is opposed to underperformance. Uh, we saw most of the sales earnings for the court Q1 um, beating expectations, very strong. Um, and for the full year, we've seen a slight slowdown and are expecting 20% growth versus uh, you know, prior 2021 highs of nearly 30%. Uh, with the super majority of the index profitable and net cash positive. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, you know, uh, long-term fundamental outlook for our index members have not changed, if not strengthened, uh, due to the rapid adoption and progress seen over the past two years. Um, and despite fears of the slowing macro environment, it's important to remember that there are meaningful structural and structural secular trends occurring over the coming years over the, as the next generation of AI and ML can help solve many of the changing demographic, labor shortage, operational challenges we are facing today. As you can see, we have pretty equal weighting in the applications and infrastructure. Um, E-commerce and consumer have been hit pretty hard by inflation and have been underperformers this year. While during the early year, days of the pandemic and in early adoption, we saw massive growth. Uh, most of this is valuation contraction. Um, cloud, cognitive computing, and consulting services have been holding stronger, and we're expecting uh, from channel checks and just tracking these companies, lots of performance and demand for, for cloud. Um, AI-enabled automation is still booming, and we believe it's the perfect short-term hedge and long-term investment vehicle as AI is transformed from being a nice-to-have to a need-to-have uh, across all facets of business functions and increasingly in governments. Software such as collaboration tools, DevOps, cybersecurity, cloud tech is more important to operations, customer service, and product innovation as, more than ever as digital transformation continues to grow from you know, a nascent $200 million field to <laughs> back in the day to approaching $2 trillion by 2025. The ROI is self-evident to business leaders and governments. And so market has fallen in lockstep, um, especially technology, we do expect a divergence upward for best-in-class AI companies from the market at large. Many longer-term drivers have also hardly even begun to demand, uh, see demand pull on the upside, such as autonomous vehicles, which, it, needless to say, have 0% adoption currently worldwide, um, though we are starting to see inklings of that uh, beginning to grow in China and the US, and I'll get to that. And so ultimately we are seeing the biggest shift in resource allocation in over a century as the gravity of AI's infrastructure and applications come to fruition. And um, similar to what Jeremy was discussing with supply chain, the chip shortage is basically coming to an end, which will boost everything downstream, which will ultimately help everything upgrade to the next level of AI and deployment as the lower cost and friction is coinciding with macroeconomic challenges of needing to reduce costs and, and make major changes. As such, areas like business process automation should see very strong adoption over the next year in this environment. Long story short, companies are doubling down on digital to save and make money. Next slide, please. So wanted to kind of highlight here, digital transformation and workforce collaboration. So these are companies that are highlighted as being very strong in this environment and uh, wanted to just briefly touch upon them. So you have Atlassian, which is the workplace collaboration tool company with platforms and products such as Jira. Um, we're still seeing workplace transformation. Um, this, this is still a growing trend and um, we're very early in the innings here. And so we're excited to see where Atlassian keeps growing into and, and innovating as they help automate middle, back office, front, mostly, mostly back and middle office, but some front office connectivity. Uh, Microsoft, I don't really need to describe them that much, but they are really dominating. And you're seeing them pull demand from even, you know, Amazon, AWS, as Azure cements itself as one of the, you know, the preeminent market leader in AI-enabled operations for companies. Um, you know, Fair Isaac, also known as FICO, I think many people know them as just FICO. Um, you're seeing lots of innovation here and demand from traditional financial services, uh, helping automate insurance claims, fraud alerts for financial services. And lastly, more on the cloud side, uh, kind of underpinning this and allowing this to happen, you see Arista, which is enabling cloud infrastructure build out for data center companies uh, to, to further enable the data-driven world. 
Uh, next, I want to talk about the biggest movers of this quarter and, and some trends here. So Baidu, um, often called the Google of China, operates in a traditional way uh, to Google in many ways. They have search and advertising, cloud and AI. They also have their own autonomous vehicle segment. Um, and they're seeing massive growth in the cloud and AI division, outpacing their traditional advertising, seeing 40% year-over-year growth. And it's currently 25% of the total revenue. Um, Apollo Go, as you can see in this image here, is their AI, Air autonomous vehicle division, saw China's first approval uh, for fully autonomous ride hailing in Beijing. Um, and it has 10 years of development that's gone into this, and they've had zero accidents. Um, and so... Baidu is one of the largest R&D centers in the world. They actually have 22,000 patents. And with $22 billion in USD on their balance sheet, which represents nearly 50% of their market cap, uh, we believe Baidu is strongly positioned to help lead the global transition to the AI economy. Uh, Baidu shares are still trading below, well below, trading well below historical averages at approximately 2x uh, 22 EV sales. And their company is roughly flat year to date which is majorly outperforming global indices. Now onto Cloudflare, um, which for previous two years has been one of our best performers as the world basically came online. Um, so Cloudflare is a cloud networking provider allowing safe and reliable internet access worldwide. Um, they do many other things. Uh, if you could look in the diagram, they, they do, you know, they help against hacks. They help make sure information is available. I mean, it's a very important platform and they're saying strong growth, approximately 50% year over year uh, revenue. Um, so they're on track to reach a billion dollars by the end of this year, uh, which is 50% year over year. Um, the company has seen a strong and steep decline in valuation. Um, this is, you know, valuation contraction due to a more tempered outlook with investors shifting away from SaaS that have higher valuations, which, which admittedly Cloudflare is slightly higher, but you know, we're still seeing innovation from this company and, and it's securing itself as a very important player in the global stage. Um, one of the more interesting things in recent developments was they recently added, added um, isolated browser access to internal networks, which essentially means think of like VMware, but just from your browser. So we think that could also be a potentially huge market angle for Cloudflare. Um, next, I want to cover the two inclusions. So I've already covered Samsara. Um, the other addition this quarter is Snowflake, which is a leading cloud-based data platform that allows enterprises to better manage and handle their data for various projects, such as database management and, and growing and growing percentage in AI and machine learning operations. So they have a highly scalable platform that helps customers break down data silos and enhance data governance while leveraging the performance of the public cloud. So they're well positioned to capitalize on the massive shift to data and analytics with strong secular tailwinds of cloud adoption. Um, they were recently ranked um, by JP Morgan's uh, Chief Information Officer Survey as the number one most discussed and plan to increase spending. So while you're seeing lots of layoffs and fears of lowering investment, everyone's basically saying they want to keep spending more money in Snowflake and it's a more increasingly attractive option to basically becoming a fundamental driver of business over the next you know, year and beyond. Um, so lastly, I'm gonna hand things off to Nina. Um, and she, you know, this wraps up our discussion of Think. If you do have any questions, please send them our way. Um, and Nina, on to you. Thanks, Zeno. Uh, hi, um, here to talk to you about H Tech performance and some healthcare tech trends that we're watching here at Robo Global. Um, so let's start with performance. Um, uh, macro drivers mentioned previously, such as inflation, uh, supply chain constraints, have been weighing uh, on healthcare sentiment as well, um, particularly with high growth companies that are loss making. Uh, additionally, in healthcare, there are healthcare specific challenges, such as labor shortages, uh, that are impacting health tech uh, companies as well. And subsequently, the H tech index. H tech returned negative 20.6% uh, during Q2 and, uh, and underperformed um, uh, the, the broader market. So um, let's, uh, let's dig a little bit deeper. Um, uh, on the left, we show the breakdown of the H tech uh, subsectors. 
um, just to show you the diversification. And the weakness was basically seen across the board. Um, so it wasn't any one particular area necessarily. Um, and um, about what we, we want to highlight is that with HTEC, you have a diversified portfolio that's not all uh, biotech, for example, it's not all large cap names. It's not all genomics. It is a nice diversification of the best in class companies across these areas that we believe represent the next decade of growth and innovation. Um, and then uh, I also want to point out the market cap breakdown. About half the portfolio is large cap uh, healthcare tech names. These are ones that our research team has deemed, uh, as mentioned, the best in class companies like Edward Science, Edward Life Sciences, Boston Scientific, uh, Becton Dickinson. These companies tend to be acquirers um, of other innovative healthcare companies. They are market leaders um, and they are uh, very stable. Uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific is another one. These are companies that um, I point them out because they are very well positioned to weather the storm of those macro factors that we mentioned previously. Um, for example, Thermo Fisher Scientific is very well diversified across many areas of healthcare, diagnostics, um, uh, biotech manufacturing, for example. Uh, they are also used for outsourcing of clinical trials by, uh, by pharma companies. And, uh, and so as healthcare seeks to automate and, um, and become more efficient, they're leaning heavily on companies like Thermo, who, by the way, grew uh, during the pandemic. They sold more diagnostic equipment that people needed for COVID testing. And now with that additional uh, footprint of, of, of more customers, they, the customers are now using all those instruments to, uh, to, to run other tests and do other things other than COVID. So that expansion during the pandemic is actually um, helping them to, uh, to maintain uh, a sustainable growth trajectory. And, and uh, Thurbo is not alone. There's other companies like Danaher, um, Abbott, uh, similarly, that really uh, grew their footprints during the pandemic and are able to leverage that uh, moving forward. Um, and also very well diversified. Uh, but we also point out that we've got these small and mid cap companies that a lot of people don't know of. Similar to, um, to, to Robo, our, our Robo index, it is, uh, the index is comprised of a mixture of names that, uh, that we believe are very well positioned uh, for near and long-term growth. And, um, and while, um, while there are some that are smaller and mid-cap, we do have uh, a nice balance to enable um, uh, investors to capitalize on all the innovation happening in healthcare. Uh, and I, the last thing I want to point out with respect to the cap weightings is that uh, during uh, uncertain times such as this, we see a lot of investors, um, healthcare focused investors migrate toward some of those stable, larger cap names, um, like the ones that I've mentioned earlier, um, and, and also ones that are not in our portfolio. And, and while that may be kind of a, a place where people are running and hiding at the moment, we continue to encourage a diversified portfolio because uh, when this market swings around, you want to have your hedge. You, you want to already be long these names that are, are trading at, um, at some historic low valuations. HTEC as an index right now is currently trading at four and a half times forward EV sales. Uh, this is a significant discount to where it was trading one year ago at seven times. And, uh, and again, these are best in class companies that are fundamentally sound. They are addressing the biggest needs in the world right now, which is human health. And, and they're not going anywhere and they are continuing to progress with innovation. So uh, great, great buying opportunity. Um, so if we could move on to the next um, slide, just wanted to highlight some of the top performers of last quarter. Uh, there's Emis Group. This is a less known healthcare IT company based in the UK. And uh, the stock performed well because of the announcement. Uh, uh, United Healthcare, United Health Group, excuse me, um, subsidiary Optum is looking to buy and acquire this company. So this, uh, this falls into the theme that we've been tracking of uh, data integration and digitization. And as healthcare becomes more and more digitized, 
um, larger companies like United Health Group or Stryker, if you will, are looking to acquire these data assets, um, these kind of software plays that uh, that help them integrate and further analyze populations. So we do expect to continue to see trends like that. In fact, last quarter, uh, the biggest M&A deal in the in the H Tech portfolio was uh, the acquisition Stryker's acquisition of Ocera. So um, so they were, they weren't the first, and they're not going to be the last. And we we expect to continue to see this. Um, and then Vertex also outperformed during the quarter. They published some uh, some strong data. Uh, they're currently working on a partnership, a project in partnership with CRISPR. A lot of people have heard of CRISPR Therapeutics, and Vertex provides uh, H Tech holders um, some nice exposure to CRISPR, with with also being diversified. So, uh, if CRISPR as a theme has a bad day, um, Vertex doesn't take as big of a hit because this is a, uh, a company with commercial revenue. It's got product lines already being bought and sold. And uh, and so this partnership with CRISPR is just a nice way to bring that exposure to the portfolio. Um, and, uh, and they published some strong safety and efficacy data on a program that they're working on to treat patients with um, beta thalassemia, as well as severe sickle cell disease. So these projects have moved into phase three, and this is uh, an example of gene editing in innovation that our portfolio provides exposure to. Um, and then we'll dig a little bit uh, more into some, um, some healthcare trends that we're watching. I mentioned briefly the, the digitization of healthcare. Uh, I wanna just make sure everyone knows that um, we, we've all heard about the healthcare worker shortages, right? How is that impacting all of us? I mean, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people that are having to wait a long time to get a procedure uh, because, uh, and a lot of people don't know why, but largely it's because there's not enough nurses staffed to get the people in um, to, to, to do all the procedures and meet the demands. And this is only going to get worse over time. The population is aging and it's growing. So we've got people living longer, people over 65, people over 80. And these are the people that need the most healthcare. Uh, that, that trajectory is on the rise. And meanwhile, the healthcare staff shortage, which was already a problem before the pandemic, is continuing to get worse. Um, even before the pandemic, one third of US nurses uh, were, um, were expected to be of retirement age by 2030. And 40% of US physicians are also on track to being a retirement age by 2030. So, uh, and, and then this was all accelerated by people getting burned out during the pandemic um, or even um, leaving the profession, doing something else for a living and also the loss of lives from people who got COVID infections. So um, the only way forward to address the growing demand of healthcare is through more automation, more robotics, more AI, more digitization, and it's happening. No, no one is saying, you know what, we can't afford that right now, or we're worried about inflation, so we're not going to invest in these areas. I just talked about United Health Group's acquisition of EMIS, right, um, and the largest acquisition last quarter. So people are investing in these areas because it's the only way forward. And, uh, and so some companies that we're watching that are in the index uh, that are very well positioned for this trend are OmniCell. This is a company that helps automate the pharmacy, another area where we have a shortage of skilled workers. Uh, there's just not enough people coming um, out of pharmacy school to meet the, the needs. And the problem with that profession right now is that a lot of pharmacists are having to do a lot of their own paperwork, a lot of their own putting pills in jars. And what we need pharmacists to do is work directly with patients and help explain medication and help administer vaccines. There are ways that they can make more money for their pharmacy by doing some of these other tasks. And yet they're, they're, they're spending a lot of time being inefficient. Um, in fact, the third leading cause of death in the United States is medical error, and that can be reduced with proper uh, medication intervention. So, um, so one way to do that is to automate a lot of that busy work and automate the putting of pills in, in bottles and, and let pharmacists, what they got their expensive degrees, do best. So um, OmniCell helps uh, provide robotics and automation to pharmacy services and hospitals, another area where pharmacy uh, pharmaceuticals are distributed. Um, and then Health Catalyst is another really interesting company that a lot of people haven't heard about. Um, they are a data analytics play, 
And if you think about a hospital system, there are hundreds of places that data is being collected. There's the lab, there's the pharmacy, there is the patient bedside, and the dozens of, of devices at the patient's bedside that are all collecting data. Uh, then there's the electronic health record. So what Health Catalyst does is they, they have a um, very sophisticated software platform that sucks all the data into one area and then, um, and then really analyzes it and then helps provide information back to a hospital on how they can run more efficiently, which, as we mentioned earlier, this is the only way forward is helping uh, hospitals and, and, uh, and medical providers do more with less. So Health Catalyst is very well positioned for this trend. Um, and you've seen the stock come in this year. And part of that was due to the fact that a lot of um, uh, software engineers work there and that, that the cost of that labor is on the rise and they've had to, um, to be competitive, uh, raise their, um, their, their wage, uh, expense. And, um, but, but it, it, it continues year after year to, to be ranked as one of the top places to work. Uh, and so we, we think that this is a strong company for the long term, and it, it is being, uh, grossly undervalued as we speak. So, um, so those are some interesting trends in terms of automation and, and healthcare worker shortage. One area that a lot of people aren't paying attention to right now as well is synthetic biology. This is, uh, think of anywhere where a chemical is being used, uh, you could potentially uh, substitute that chemical for something um, biologic that was made basically in a lab. So uh, a common use case is impossible meats. The, the component that makes impossible burgers look like real burgers, that juiciness uh, is actually made out of synthetic biology. And, and the use cases are far and wide, agriculture, um, in industrials, uh, it's already growing and there's a lot of science happening. Um, but one of the fastest applications for SynBio is in biotech. And so that's where H Tech can prov provide exposure. Um, uh, for example, we've got um, uh, we have Roche listed here. Uh, so antibiotic resistance. A lot of people have heard about this, where uh, doctors are trying to be more reserved about about prescribing antibiotics because they're starting to lose their their effectiveness. And uh, and so this is a growing worldwide problem. Each year, 700,000 people die of antibiotic resistant infections. And, uh, and, and it's just unfortunate because once they get sick with a certain bacterial infection, if there's no antibiotic for it, and we can't keep up with, man, uh, with coming up with new antibiotics at the pace at which they're needed, uh, that, that number is only going to get worse. So um, H Tech member Roche has partnered with a uh, Symbio company, um, not in the portfolio, called Ginkgo Bioworks. Uh, to develop the next generation of antibiotics using synthetic DNA. So uh, really exciting project there. And, um, and I should mention that uh, Ginkgo Bioworks is a client of a company called Twist. So Twist is an enabler of this synthetic biology industry and uh, a member of HTEC. And they provide the pieces of DNA that go into the manufacturing of synthetic biology products. So, uh, so a really interesting company and a, and a great way to get exposure to that, uh, to that fast growing sector. Um, in fact, Twist is growing so fast, they, they're growing more than 20% a year on average, that their manufacturing plant, it has reached capacity or it will by the end of this year, they've had to build a whole other factory just to meet the needs and the, and the growing demand um, of their synthetic biology tools. So, uh, and, and what they're able to do um, is they can manufacture um, what we call little pieces of DNA, um, oligonucleotides. Uh, they can make 10,000 times the amount of conventional methods by using a silicon chip. So uh, it's a really interesting way to take silicon technology and deploy it in biotech to, to make orders of magnitude larger numbers of these pieces of DNA that are being used in so many applications. So we mentioned synthetic biology, but another place where they're being used is in next-gen sequencing. In order to run a next-gen sequencing test, you have to take the sample and you have to um, prepare it. Uh, and then you have to run it on an instrument. And that preparation stage 
needs these pieces of synthetic DNA uh, to, to, to make these prep kits. And so Twist is able to, uh, to manufacture these at scale um, and do it so at a very competitive cost because they can do so many in such a small amount of space. Uh, they're, over, they're able to offer it at one tenth the cost. So effectively they have industrialized uh, so this, this type of technology. And um, we have more information about that on our website if you're curious, just go to roboglobal.com and, and search for Twist. Um, so anyway, uh, and, and then uh, I want to mention HTech no company Codexis. Uh, this is one that really made a name for itself more so in the last year than anything else. They manufacture the enzyme, again, more another synthetic biology play, uh, the enzyme that goes into Pfizer's Paxlovid. So this is like so far the best working drug we know to treat covid and the a component that goes into it is made by this Symbio player. So um, uh, three great ways to get exposure to this theme through our portfolio. Um, and with that, I think we've, we've I hope, hopefully passed along a lot of information to get you jazzed about why it's important to be diversified across health tech. We'll stop there and take questions. Okay, thank you very much, Nina. And um we'll open the floor to questions. Um, so don't be shy and feel free to type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I see we have a few that have come in already. Um, and perhaps we'll start with uh, the question around um, examples of deflationary companies in our portfolios. And um, I think that's, um, that's a very good question. It's, um, it's a really important thing to understand that uh, automation uh, is in itself a very deflationary uh, force that's been at play now for some time. And I'd say technology in general uh, has been the biggest driver of uh, uh, deflation in, in our economy now for um, uh, well over a, a decade. And um, I think it's fair to say that today uh, we have both inflationary forces at, uh, and deflationary forces at play in the economy. And so of course, inflation is making the headlines because we haven't seen such increases in the consumer price index for, for decades. Uh, and we could debate um, the, the reason for that, that surge uh, but the reality is that while uh, the economy is facing this inflation uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, pr the prices of uh, input costs into businesses, um, the, uh, I think the, the autonomous economy or the automated economy is really rewriting the economic rules. Uh, the labor shortages, the supply chain issues, uh, the, the margin headwinds that are playing so many industries to, uh, today, uh, the only clear way out of, of, of this is for companies to adopt technology and automation. Uh, so I'd say in, in general, the three portfolios include a lot of deflationary companies that are bringing the ability to their customers to reduce their, their cost. And so, you know, some examples of that in, in the robo index would be, of course, the whole factory automation plays that are dramatically reducing production costs for the manufacturing sector. But you see similar dynamics at play with the healthcare automation, uh, be it a using a surgical robot for procedures or automating uh, pharmacies, central pharmacies in hospitals and, um, and, and elsewhere. Uh, in the food and agriculture, uh, industry where we're seeing automation technology being deployed not only to uh, monitor the quality of the of the crops but of course to improve the yields and and and, and to lower costs in general uh, and and so I'm going to ask uh, Zeno and Nina to to come in as well and perhaps provide some examples of companies that are dramatically reducing costs for their customers and Zeno do you want to start yeah sure thanks Jeremy yeah so when you think about what's causing inflation right now. And if you think about the technology that we have today that we didn't have a decade or two before, a lot's changed. Um, on one hand, I would say that nearly every think constituent is deflationary in both the short and longer term. Um, you've got problems such as, you know, inflation, labor shortages, high, just high cost all around. Um, 
Now, some of this was driven by the chip shortage, which is easing up right now, but that's because cars are becoming increasingly complex and smart. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to see AVs coming through the pipeline soon, which should reduce the cost of lots of transportation and allow an easing on air, you know, air traffic, because you'll, you'll be able to have autonomous vehicles transporting from Dallas to LA, you know, going from port to, to major cities overnight instead of just on planes. So that, that alone will just, you know, boost uh, the throughput and utilization and, you know, lower costs for everyone all around. Um, if someone really needs to get something really fast, it'll be, you know, ultra fast. But in the meantime, you're going to see deflation from that end. Um, from the business process and cloud standpoint, you're going to see, you know, improvements in front, middle and back office, right? So, you know, a cost to business is just the time it takes to, to provide superior customer service and, and not miss, you know, make any mistakes along the way. And you've got companies like Atlassian and Pure Storage and others that come up, you know, Pure Storage is more, for, for growing storage for these AI constituents. But you've got, um, you know, Samsara, which I mentioned earlier, uh, if you, you know, going through their, their customer stories, every single one of them talks about how they're saving them cost, which is letting them survive and reduce the cost of service to customers while providing superior tracking and service to customers. So you've got, you know, for example, they, they recently had one of the, the largest Fortune 500 logistics companies. They started with one area, maybe, you know, telematics, and now they're doing video monitoring and connected cloud operations. And they're saving tons of money. They're saving fuel costs. They're saving, you know, time on maintenance. They're more predictive. They know what's going to happen next. So that's a massive play in power for, for customers, um, including governments. They're seeing municipalities, utilities also playing into that and needing that, that cost reduction. Um, you know, we're about to see one of the largest transitions of ener energy utilization since gasoline, automobiles hit mainstream, and then electricity empowering our computers. I mean, if you think about it, this entire call we're on right now, the Zoom call was basically the result of using AI. You've got AI designing chips to do these camera sensors that are, you know, allowing us to transmit compressed video globally across the world, wherever you all are. We take it for granted now, but, you know, back in the day, we'd all have to fly in to do this quarterly call. I'd say that's deflationary. Uh, and so if you think about it in that way, you know, you also have that type of impact coming from from players that are that are in thing. Um, you know, there are other ones such as, you know, you know, JD.com in, in China is doing drone delivery. Once again, you're offsetting you know, and improving throughput with a lower cost modality of transportation. And so if you keep, if you keep moving things along that way, you're going to see, you know, once again, massive deflationary pr pressure from AI as you automate more and more and more. Um, I can add to that, but I think that covers most of it. Uh, for healthcare, I guess, similar to the themes that I was mentioning earlier, for example, um, Twist's ability to offer its synthetic biology products at one-tenth the cost uh, because they're able to um, manufacture more efficiently. Uh, so that, that would be one example for sure. But, um, uh, and, and I brought up Health Catalyst earlier, but maybe it'd be good to provide some examples, um, particularly with this um, inflation question in mind. So um, Health Catalyst helps hospitals operate more efficiently, as I mentioned earlier. They did one project where they analyzed data at a hospital and they were able to um, generate 400 additional hours of nursing time by helping them operate more efficiently. And therefore that those hours, that time could be allocated toward uh, other patient care duties. Um, but really, if you have a nursing shortage, it's not even a matter of how do we reallocate this personnel now that we've cut down on the amount of things that they have to do. It's really how do we manage with the nurses that we have because there's just too much work for them right now. So, uh, so that's one example um, that they were able to uh, add revenue, over $50,000 worth of revenue at Texas Children's Hospital, for example, by helping to streamline their um, scheduling of appointments. So they... There, there's no limit to what they can do within a hospital. And because they're already connected to hundreds of devices throughout the hospital, they have real-time access to everything that's going on. So for example, during COVID, uh, they were able to sort of shift their services and analyze very quickly what it was hospitals needed. And they were able to help 
guide them to say, here's how you can reallocate staff hours or uh, move things around to help you operate more efficiently during this time. Um, and now in this environment with the nursing shortage, they're seeing higher demand for those services where they're able to help address how they can help um, hospitals um, operate with uh, fewer labor hours. So, um, so they're in a really great position to be able to pivot based on whatever healthcare needs are um, of the time. So, uh, so hopefully those are two examples that'll, that'll help. Thanks, Nina. Uh, moving on, we have questions around portfolio level valuations for all three indices. And a question more specific to HTEC on earnings revision. So let's start with the, the portfolio level valuations. And I've touched on that earlier in the presentation. When it comes to Robo, maybe we can bring back the slide uh, with the PE chart for Robo um, that shows the next 12 months uh, PE. We're basically standing at around 21, 22 times um, right now. And um, you can see that is um, significantly below the long-term historical average that's been closer to 25, 26 times. And then uh, the previous high, which was during 2021, when the index was trading well in the 30s. Um, so very significant multiple compression there. And uh, when it comes to HTEC and, um, and THINK, uh, we tend to look not so much at the PE because there are companies that are loss making in those indices. Uh, so we look at the sales multiple and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna let Nina and Zeno comment around that. For HTEC, um, the 12 month sales revision uh, was an average for the index of 2.9% up, upward, um, and then 4.7% uh, downward. And uh, to Jeremy's point, we tend to focus more on the sales um, and sales multiple. For example, the data point I gave earlier on the four and a half times uh, EV sales, um, next 12 month EV sales for HTEC is somewhere where we're more focused uh, when we're looking at performance and, and, um, and valuation relative over time. So um, Jeremy, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. So a positive uh, sales revision for HTEC over the last 12 months uh, is what we've seen. And over the past three months, uh, very stable, uh, marginally up as well, 0.1% over the past three months. So really no, uh, major deterioration in terms of the earnings outlook for HTEC for sure. And, and, and Zeno, do you want to comment on valuations for the AI index? Sure, yes. So I think what's interesting now is that the momentum and areas that I discussed earlier, we're actually back to 5X forward EV sales. So that's the same valuation, relative valuation, as the bottom of March 2020 for, for the Think Index. Um, and kind of in between that time of, of you know, tro the troll, the peak was 10x. So we've retraced back, you know, March 2020, 5x. November or March, yeah, I think November ish or February, actually February 2021, we had 10x and now we're back to 5x, um, even as the adoption has grown. So that being said, we've, we've only had slight um, retrace and, and lowering of sales this year. I mean, there, there has been, you know, we have growth, so it's just kind of like Sensara. We've had some some slowdown in other companies, but overall it's dropped to 20%, which is still a very high growth rate given the, the macro environment. Um, and I think some of this will, will be a surprise upwards as, um, you know, you do see companies making decisions to to continue investing in the core product. Uh, but yeah, so, so valuations back to pretty much all time lows right now uh, on that standpoint. So um, yeah. Okay, well, we're getting right uh, to the top of the hour. So we'll, we'll, we'll do one more question. I think uh, uh, there's a question around quantum computing. Um, and, and I think Zeno could make a brief comment in terms of uh, what companies are exposed to that and, 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 and the, the outlook in terms of the China versus US in quantum computer. Right, so... A lot of people 
you know, quantum. Um, a lot of people look at it, U.S. versus China. There's also Europe. You also have Canada with some big players coming through. Um, in the Think Index, we have names like IBM, Google, Microsoft with, you know, both direct and indirect plays. Um, you know, Amazon, Amazon and others are looking to do both their own hardware and also just obviously allow kind of hybrid, you know, traditional AI and quantum computing on their platforms as a service. So, um, you know, this is still very early stages. Um, I would say almost no company really has, you know, you have some pure play companies, but no one really is driving that much revenue from this yet. Um, you do have theoretical um, quantum supremacy being shown um, for some pretty obscure problems. So there's not really any major solutions or groundbreaking technology that has been, um, you know, solved uh, from quantum. But um, the question seems to be around, you know, will there be kind of like a, a winner takes all and one one drops off? And I, I, I think it's, that's a very hard question to answer. Uh, it's still very early, um, but we are ex excited by that. Um, and I, I would say, you know, think companies right now have less than uh, one percent of revenue and, you know, maybe, you know, to to quantum. Uh, but there are also companies that provide indirect um, yeah. For, you know, technology to these. Um, and, and also a lot of this is being developed and theorized using traditional AI architecture. Um, so I don't really have an answer for you on whether there's going to be a specific winner. I think, I think kind of how you have, you know, Amazons and Microsofts and Googles, you might see similar, uh, you know, players that have different angles or advantages to, to the types of problem they solve. And, and obviously a lot of it goes down to the partnerships and, and players and ecosystems they, they dive into. All right. Well, I think in the interest of time, we're going to stop here. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we hope that was uh, helpful to you, and we very much look forward to uh, talking to you again soon. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.